Hi, everyone. Uh, I first want to thank, get started, uh, thank you for the break. We'll have one more speaker before lunch. Uh, <clears throat> I first want to thank Joyce and Marta and Jeff for their speeches. They did a great job. I think this is a great start to this event. Uh, our next speaker came from Colorado, and he's the director of the Wildlife Law Program uh, for Friends of Animals, which actually is based uh, for here in Connecticut in Darien. Um, he spent the past two decades working on litigation to protect both wildlife and natural ecosystems. And he also spent several years uh, directing the University of Denver's Environmental Law Clinic. So uh, please join me to give a warm welcome to our next speaker, Michael Harris. Thanks, Frank. Is it working? Yeah. I use this too. Uh, well, let me start by giving my thanks as well to all the students and to Professor Thomas for putting on the symposium. It's obviously a extremely important and surprisingly timely, even though this has been a very long, long, long problem that we've had. It's become timely again. Before I get uh, going with my slideshow, um, Marta, you asked this question about sort of like what's the root of our um, moral decay here, basically. And um, I'll, I'll just too quickly two places you might want to look. One, um, you know, Aldo Leopold said it's gadgetry, the Industrial Revolution. But if you really want to look at the archaeological record of this decay, there's a book by a woman, uh, her last name is Reisner, called The uh, Ch uh, Chalice and the Blade. Oh, yeah. And I would strongly suggest looking at that. It's sort of a great, yeah, it's great insight on how we may have gotten to uh, such disrespect to animals and the ecosystem. Um, I will start with this slide. One that no matter how many times I look at it, it still just blows my mind, right? And this is a, uh, a rough listing in order of ranking, you know, how bad some bad things are with respect to international crime. Now, this may not be the exact ranking that you might see elsewhere. I've seen different, uh, different rankings of these four crimes. The truth of the matter is when it comes to something like this, there's not a whole lot of statistics, right? It's not being done in the open, and we really don't know how bad any of these crimes are. Some of the estimates I've seen on wildlife trafficking uh, is that it's about a $20 billion a year industry in the world. Now, these four crimes have several similarities. The first is that it's often the most vulnerable that are the victims. They're victimized by these crimes. Drug dealers, human traffickers, smugglers target the young and the impoverished to do their dirty work. With respect to wildlife trade, international criminals often force local villages to do the poaching either by offering them scant but much needed money or by directly threatening them and their families to do it. It's very much a top-up enterprise where the money's flowing to the very few on the top of the syndicate. And those risking their lives doing the poaching or the smuggling see very little of it. Um, the second similarity is there's a dichotomy between developing and uh, developed countries. You know, generally with wildlife trafficking and human trafficking and drugs, we see a flow from developing countries to developed countries. With guns, it's often the opposite direction. The third similarity, and the one that I'm going to talk about in greater depth later on with respect to wildlife trafficking, has to do with um, the, all three of these crimes have really caused a great debate about what their solution is, right? That is, is it a wholly a law enforcement problem? We just need to throw more law enforcement officers and money at the problem? Or is it a deeply rooted social problem that has to be solved from within? And again, I'll return to that particular topic. Uh, in, a f in a few minutes. Now, there is a dissimilarity, and I don't mean to be callous here at all, because there's a lot of human suffering caused by all four of these crimes. <clears throat> but of the four, only wildlife trafficking is running out of victims, and quickly. Um, there is no doubt that extinctions of most of animals caught up in the wildlife trade are looming, and looming soon. We heard Joyce talk about the elephants, but you could look down the list of the animals that are being trafficked, and there's not a whole lot of hope for them. So time is of the essence. There's not a lot of time for a long-term plan to solve this. So this really isn't a disclaimer as more as it is to introduce you a little bit about what we do, what I do, and what Friends of Animals Wildlife Law Program does. 
we're not, um, we're not working in the international justice system, bringing cases in international court over wildlife trafficking. Um, I haven't even attended a CITES Conference of the Parties uh, meeting in my lifetime, but I follow it all, obviously. I know enough to know how dire the situation is. And I've studied it enough to know that, you know, it's the exporting countries, the often, you know, often developing nations in Africa and Asia and South America that are being asked to shoulder a burden of the enforcement load here. And you can sort of think about how little sense that really makes. And that it's really time to shift that burden back onto the importing countries like the United States to protect fauna, right? We're the countries that are the biggest offenders when it comes to both legal and illegal wildlife trade. Um, and that's sort of the work we're trying to do at Friends of Animals. Uh, we're trying to use domestic laws to uh, protect and liberate exotic wildlife in the United States. And to the extent we can, to prevent exotic wildlife and their parts from ever getting here in the first place. And there's a lot of stuff that could be done at home, not only in our country, but other importing countries that um, often gets pushed to the side because the focus gets put on where the crimes are occurring in the exporting countries. So these next few slides are, are fully inf just informational. They do sort of um, shed a little light about this dichotomy between developing and, and uh, developed countries and sort of the impact that dichotomy has had on wildlife uh, in developing countries. This one here, blows people's minds. Uh, they think I made it up. I, I, I didn't. I promise you that. <laughs> One remaining African antelope uh, in the wild, then there's 80 in captivity in the United States. Um, I have had the, uh, the privilege of showing this slide twice at conferences in Africa. And you think you're shocked. You should see the dismay that they have about this. And, you know, they're like, give us our animals back, please, right? And obviously that may not be possible because of the, where they've been living, but you could see their reaction when they see this. You could understand their reaction when they see this slide. And then there are these, um, these three animals, the scimitar horned oryx, the dama gazelle, and the attics. All three are uh, uh, antelope species uh, native to northern Africa. Friends of Animals have been working on protecting these animals in their home ranges and here in the United States for, for over a decade. Um, there are, these animals are struggling to survive in their home ranges, you know, without adequate protection um, from poachers, they would be extinct today. Um, a lot of NGOs, including Friends of Animals, have put a lot of money into protecting the remaining ones in the wild. In the meantime, there are over 10 to 15,000 of each of these species in Texas alone on hunting ranches, okay? And then we have all of these little guys that make up the bulk of the pet trade, right? Their populations are being decimated around the world and their habitats are being placed under tremendous stress from the poaching. So why are they coming to us? Why are we bringing these animals to the United States? Well, a desire for exotic pets, okay? Um, the amount of, you know, whether you are on the web or subscribe to one of the many, many, many journals, uh, trade journals that, that offer these up, or you just see a, a, an ad in a local back page of a paper, it's, it's it, it, there's no way to put in words how many animals are offered for sale this very morning in the United States. And then there is our belief that exotic animals are amusing. And uh, this is an ad I know it's, well, it's not too hard to read. It's from a uh, company called Exotic Animals Are Us. They will arrange to bring monkeys and wild cats and exotic birds and kangaroos, African antelope, all to your next home or office party, if you wish. Um, there are literally thousands of these outfits in the United States, not to mention all the roadside exotic animal, you know, come over and stop when you're in the middle of Kansas and see this and see that. Um, so amusement. Then there's the exotic meat industry and some appetite for these animals. Here's one place on the web, and I just pulled this off of the website just about a week ago, 
You can get a camel steak, a lion steak, addicts meat. The list goes on and on. Um, according to this website, they're proud to show that it's um, had what about threefold increase in their in this industry in just the last few years. I had to throw this in here too. If you if you want to go see the carnage yourself, there's an invitation by the owners to visit, and they're apparently interested in your best exotic meat jokes. If you if you would have such a joke. And then there's medicinal purposes, something we often assign to Asian cultures. But the reality is, is that there's millions of Americans or people in the United States who subscribe to these beliefs and use, whether it's tiger parts, bear bile, um, you know, a number of other animals that they believe have medicinal qualities. And then our desire to use them for sport. And what I mean by this is really two separate things. One is the killing of these animals in their home ranges, like in Africa, for instance, and their importation of their parts back, their horns and their tusks and their heads. It also means the killing of those animals here in the United States, ones that are in captivity on home ranges, on, 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 um, excuse me, on hunting ranches. Uh, this here is a web page from, there are hundreds of these ranches in Texas and Oklahoma. And this is uh, one of their pages with advertising their prices. It goes on and on, by the way. I mean, there's just a long list of things down here. The most expensive are some of the most rarest animals on earth. Uh, but you see that they have a no kill, no pay policy, so a guarantee. The Addicts Antelope, which is one of the antelope I mentioned earlier, goes for a trophy price of $6,900. That doesn't include your lodging, your guide fees, like you really need a guide, um, and it, your, you know, your, your food and your wine and all that kind of fancy stuff. I'm sure you go with your lodge experience, as well as everyone who takes care of the carcass afterwards and mounts it for you and all that stuff. These are fifteen to twenty thousand uh, dollar dollar trips, right? And I guess then you go lie and you say you bagged it in the wilderness or something like that. Okay. So let me get back to this question about whether, like with drugs and human trafficking, we're facing a law enforcement problem or a systematic social problem. I'm sure many in this room, including myself, at first blush, would probably say a little of both. Well, let me ask a question. Is it possible to imagine that the question itself has become the problem, that we're just trying to pit one extreme answer against the other extreme answer. It's sort of that old hawks versus doves debate that we have. I would propose that law and society are, for the most part, intricately bound, right? Don't get me wrong, extremes exist. It is possible for a community with strong leadership to resolve internal social problems without resorting to legal institutions. But even one of our most well-known American um, community organizers, Mr. Obama, became President Obama to better utilize the law to solve drug problems and poverty problems and crime and an, an assortment of other social issues. There's also the other extreme, which we don't really need to talk about. It's not going to happen, hopefully, in this country, and that would be a dictatorship that uses the law just to suppress social problems or, or, or make them vanish. But I think the hallmark of a healthy nation is one in which law and society do work together. Now, I'm sure as any second year law student can tell us in this room, um, it is said that the law has two principal purposes, to punish and to deter, okay? But deter, of course, means more than just putting the fear of God into everyone that they're going to go to jail, right? It's much more complex than that. Laws can ma be made to deter through threat of punishment, of course, but they could help build informational dispositories to inform and educate people. And they could even be used to provide positive incentives to conform one's behavior. But most importantly, we want our laws to be seen as legitimate social choices that guide individual decisions and that reward those who act accordingly. Yes, it might very well be that that reward is staying out of jail, okay? But more often, I think it's couched in a phrase that I bet every one of us wants to hear if we're ever accused of a crime or if we die. 
And that is, she was a good law-abiding person. Right? Now, I don't mean that you don't want to get into trouble sometime for a good cause, but let's be real. I mean, that's ultimately about the only reward you're going to get out of being a member of society in the long run. Right? Someone stand up for you like that. Now, the point of this slide and the point of, of, what, of where I'm going is that ultimately to be successful, a law must transform over time from being an individual obligation, something we feel compelled to do, to a social norm, right? Um, it needs to be a bona fide ethical responsibility that we feel we have within the society. Society did not wake up one day and declare that murder was unethical. It woke up one day to find that it was forbidden, right? Carved on some stone, and I'll leave it to everyone's beliefs as to the source of that stone. Um, but over time, it became immoral as well, right? Uh, some of us have seen another example of this in our, in our lifetimes. Uh, a lot of the younger people probably will be flabbergasted by this. But when I was a teenager, drink, uh, drinking and driving was dealt with very leniently in the law, right? I would say by the time I got out of law school, we had a legal obligation not to drive under the influence. I think today we're approaching a belief that it's just morally wrong. It's, a, it's, a, it's akin to a attempted murder. So that's a, an actually a very rapid change from something that was seen as the norm was the opposite to a legal obligation to a complete reversal in the so social norm over a particular social issue. Sadly, right, with regard to wildlife trafficking, we have generally failed to punish we generally failed to deter, and we haven't created a new social norm. You know, each of these laws listed here are all over 40 years old, okay? And um, instead of being heralded as universal successes, the Endangered Species Act and the National Environmental Policy Act are repeatedly called ineffective, cumbersome, litigation drivers, right? Well, I remain an optimist, okay? And so I believe all three of these laws can still be effectively used to help end the wildlife tr um, trade. The truth of the matter is, is that the Endangered Species Act and the National Environmental Policy Act remain two of the strongest environmental laws on this planet. Um, you don't even have to go much further than climate change to sort of get that, get, you know, to prove that proposition. You know, the federal government has done absolutely nothing to develop new laws to combat climate change. But activists continue to use both the Endangered Species Act and the National Environmental Policy Act to push the ball along, to force the government to continue to evaluate the impact climate change has had on the environment and on species, right? And as a result of those efforts, using existing laws, the arguments for changing the current social norm, which is apparently to do nothing over, so, uh, over climate change, get harder and harder to justify, right? So these laws may not be the solution, but they continue to be the most effective tools we have to continue to build towards that solution. Now, I'm not saying we don't need new laws to combat what the wildlife trade. Obviously, we do. But I also believe that if all the young lawyers in the room here and all of us activists continue to defend the Endangered Species Act and the National Environment Policy Act for what they are, strong and effective tools, we can not only use them to more successfully deter and punish wildlife crimes, but more importantly, hopefully we can continue to advance that ball towards you know, an animal ethical transformation, the likes of which Aldo Leopold struggled to achieve his whole life. All right, so there's a theme here. I'm going to go like real deep, and I'm going to like back off a little bit. I'm going to go deep again. So I'm, this is I'm bread and butter stuff, and I'll lighten it up a little bit here. Not that it's any less boring. Um, it's, it's the law, what can you say? Um, a quick overview of the Endangered Species Act. Um, the Endangered Species Act only protects species that are listed as endangered or threatened. A uh, vast majority of species that have made it on that list have done so because of a citizen-initiated petition process. Someone presented the information to the government to show that a species was either going extinct or was reasonably likely to go extinct. Um, 
a majority of those species on the list are on there for two reasons. Detrimental loss of their habitat or utilization of that species for either a direct or an indirect economic reason, right? Some, some type of economic development is driving these species to be killed off. Um, once they are listed, the endangered species prevents their take. Now, this means more than just preventing them from being killed. It also means that humans aren't allowed to harass them or bring them into captivity, generally. There are exceptions, and we'll be talking about those in a second. Now, this surprises a lot of people, particularly when I do talk to folks who um, are abroad. But the Endangered Species Act, and there's a long history of this, and we may hear some more about it in the afternoon, but it protects both native species and exotic species, so species around the world, wherever they may be found. And the reason for this is threefold. Back in, uh, in between 1969 and 1972, when Congress was debating the need for the modern Endangered Species Act, there was a number of concerns. The first was that consumptive uses of captive wildlife would stimulate a demand for projects, products which might further be satisfied by wild populations abroad. Second, persons illegally obtaining specimens from wild populations would claim them to be captive produced. And finally, there was the concern that captive propagation is sustainable only with the continuous supply of wild caught animals. At the time, a lot of this was foreign animals, whether it was alligator skins or tusks or a number of other products that were being imported into the country. So this expansion coincided with the um, Congress's decision to direct the Secretary of State to help do a worldwide treaty, which is now known as CITES. Now, there are some exceptions to the take prohibition. Any person can obtain a permit under Section 10 of the ESA uh, to take an endangered or threatened species for really two reasons, for a scientific purpose or to help enhance the propagation or survival of the species. Now, first blush, those sound like way broad, right? I mean, geez, scientific purposes can be, can be couched as quite broad. But they, they are limited, and they're limited by three really important factors that the government likes to ignore quite a bit, to be honest with you. And that is a permit can only be issued if the, it was applied for in good faith. But more importantly, the next two are very important. That the permit will not operate to the disadvantage of the species. And that the, uh, that the permit is consistent with the conservation purposes and policies of the Endangered Species Act, which are laid out in Section 2 of the Endangered Species Act. Now, unfortunately, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's current interpretation of the permitting provisions is completely backwards. It's totally putting the act's conservation purposes or its conservation ethic on its head. That's why that's backwards. That's not a mistake. Okay. <laughs> um, in effect, they are using, that's the federal government, Fish and Wildlife Service in particular, is using the Endangered Species Act to legitimize the harvest of both captive bred and wild endangered species around the world, this country and abroad. I'll give you a couple examples. I mentioned African antelope uh, earlier, the scimitar horned oryx, the dama gazelle, and the attix. Remember, all three are critically endangered in the wild. For years, like over a decade, Fish and Wildlife Service refused, despite their dire situation, to list them as endangered species. And the primary reason for that, it should be obvious by now, to protect the economic use of them on hunting ranches in the United States. Well, after litigation and being forced to finally make that tough choice, what was the government's solution? To list the species and then grant permits to all the hunting ranches. All the hunting ranches. All of them. I mean, like, there's no really rigorous work that had to be done. I mean, I've seen applications... They put out some guidelines on how to fill out an application if you're a, a, a sport hunting ranch, telling you what answers to put in each box. I've seen applications that can't even get it right. They can't even put the canned answers for the canned hunting. You know, they just <laughs> literally don't, don't do anything, and they still get their permit. So that was their solution. But to this day, no matter how much we press them, Fish and Wildlife Service can't produce to us any documentation or other evidence that those permits do not 
operate to the disadvantage of the species as a whole, or that they're, you know, they're consistent with the conservation ethic of the Endangered Species Act. And then there's the um, African lion. Many of you may have, have read that just last week, the African lion was proposed for listing as a threatened species. Um, but, they, but simultaneous with the uh, listing proposal, Fish and Wildlife Service has proposed what is known as a special take rule, a special 9D rule. Like the permits under Section 10, a Section 9 rule is supposed to not disadvantage the species, and it's supposed to be consistent with the conservation principles of the Endangered Species Act. Well, let me read to you the rationale for the special take rule. While the service cannot control hunting of foreign species, such as African lion, we can regulate their importation and thereby require that U.S. imports of sport-hunted African lion trophy specimens and are attained in a manner that is consistent with the purposes of the act and the conservation of the subspecies in the wild. By allowing importation from range countries that have management plans, such management plans would be expected to address, but are not limited to, evaluating population levels and trends, their biological needs, quotas, management practices, a re, sort of a redundancy there, legal protection, local community involvement, and use of hunting fees for conservation. In evaluating these factors, we will work closely with the range countries and interested parties to obtain the best scientific and commercial data. That all sounds good. It's a lot of rhetoric there. Um, but we've heard it all before, right? We've heard it with regards to rhinos and elephants. And we've heard it over and over throughout the years. But look, keeping populations managed at such low herd le levels is just not viable, right? Their populations can collapse due to habit um, in a heartbeat due to you know, disease, famine, drought, or as we've seen in recent years, just an uptick of demand on the black market, right? But once again, Fish and Wildlife Service just asks us blindly to believe that these special takes, as they call them, will promote conservation efforts and will offset the demand for illegal trade. But before making such a leap of faith, we need to demand from Fish and Wildlife Service some scientific proof. In reality, and this is supported by a growing body of scientific literature, a legal harvest or what I'll call a dual market. And a dual market is where you have um, some members of a species are allowed to be legally take, others are not, therefore it would be more of a uh, black market take. It coexists together. Uh, such a dual market, more often than not, will increase demand for wild stock, will remove the stigma, and thus legitimize the ownership of these um, animals and their parts, and more importantly, be used as cover to launder wild-caught animals. And what I mean by that, <clears throat> I heard earlier on talking about the burden um, uh, of what happens if you get caught. And there's a, obviously a difference in, a, in burden if you're, you're being asked to, um, you know, in a civil context, uh, uh, forfeit or pay civil penalties for, um, for smuggling in some illegal wildlife. But let's talk about it in terms of what the real teeth is, right? Criminal punishment for this. Now, the burden there is beyond a reasonable doubt. And let's talk about some of the obstacles to that when it comes to the wildlife trade. First and foremost, if you're at all an educated smuggler, where are you going to say you got it from? The legal market or the illegal market? I say legal market, right? Okay, so that leads now to an investigation. How much resources are we putting in to wildlife investigations? Really none. It's really, if you got caught, you're, you're fairly unlucky, to be honest with you. Um, we're not going to do a murder investigation. We don't have a DNA database to turn to. Um, so let's you go, you'll track that. Well, where'd you get it? Okay, I got it from such and such hunting ranch in Nairobi or such and such ranch in Texas or whatever. Well, these, these, yeah, there's a fine line between the legal and the illegal in this industry, and they purposefully keep information very difficult to obtain. You know, oh, well, the records must have got messed up. This has been documented, documented by many investigators in the field, right? So we're not talking about, uh, we're talking about an opportunity to really increase the ability for the black market through, through the ability to launder through the legal market. 
Um, oddly enough, by the way, Fish and Wildlife Services acknowledge that all of these are true. They have been asked to go one step further than they're doing now by some of the uh, proponents of sport hunting and other types of, of, of uh, keeping a legalized market for these animals to just sort of split list. And what that's meant is it's like, well, all the animals in captivity should just be not, I mean, they're not, we're taking care of them, so they shouldn't be on the list at all. Put the animals in captive, uh, excuse me, in the wild on the list. And Fish and Wildlife Services rejected that, and they cited to these. But then when we say, well, you're creating the same dual market through the permitting process, how do you justify that? They won't respond. Dead silence. There's just no rationale whatsoever. And what's really occurring through this new interpretation of the, um, both the 10, 10A1 permitting processes as well as the Section 9 special rules is a, is a form of domestication of animals. Um, and it's happening to wildlife everywhere, right? Apparently, it's better to keep all the remaining African antelope on hunting ranches in Texas, right? Or it's better to intensely manage small wild groups of African lions than it is to vigorously enforce the Endangered Species Act, right? And, it's, and again, it's happening everywhere, right? Wolves and grizzly bears being, are, being, are being removed from the Endangered Species Act and turned over, their management turned over to states that have no interest in protecting them. Um, the continued existence of the wild plain bison is being left to a couple, like really small herds on public lands and a bunch of private ranches. Um, we learned just last week that this extends to marine species uh, in which the, uh, Fish and Wild, the National Marine Fishery Service denied to protect the critically endangered queen conch um, on the grounds that it should be left to inadequate regulatory mechanisms established by underfunded Caribbean governments that essentially only want to continue to harvest them. Um, you know, I think the important point here is that Fish and Wildlife Service is engaging in this type of interpretation of the act without ever justifying again how sport and money, takes for sport and money, promote the true conservation ethic of the act. And it's incumbent really on all of us to keep the pressure on them to do so, right? Someday, it's going to happen. The theories that they're proffering are going to fail. They're going to fail legally, and they're going to fail scientifically. And then maybe we could sort of regroup and start to pick ourselves up off the ground and get going again with the real conservation ethic that's embodied in the Endangered Species Act. Okay, the National Environmental Policy Act. NEPA, it's our so-called environmental charter, closest thing we have to an environmental constitutional amendment. Under NEPA, agencies must take a hard look at the um, significant environmental impacts from major federal projects. Agencies must investigate and evaluate alternatives to that project to help reduce impacts on the environment. Uh, they must explore reasonable ways to mitigate impacts from projects on the environment. And the goal of NEPA, and this is really important, it's been declared by the, by the Supreme Court in the good old days of the Supreme Court to be twofold right, to inform the public so that the public can be actively involved in decision making and also to ensure that the decision maker herself in the agency sees the impacts associated with the proposal of the agency and different courses of action to take to alleviate it. Now the hard question to ask is should NEPA require agencies to examine and disclose impacts on individual animals. And uh, to be frank, I'm not talking about the types of, of animal rights that we, we just heard about. I don't think NEPA is the substantive tool to get us there. In fact, it's a procedural tool to get us information. Um, what I'm ta talking about is whether NEPA can be used and interpreted to advance what I'll call a, a, a right to ethical consideration. So here is a passage, a little bit altered by, by me, but it's the heart of it, from an article on ethics and wildlife policy. And um, 
Let me just read, read it to you. You can see it on screen. There's a growing recognition among conservationists and biologists that ethics must play a greater role in wildlife policy. But sadly, while many agree that ethics must play a central role in any project involving animals, it is often interesting to note that in many books on non-human interactions, there is often no mention of ethics. This needs to change. These authors go on, and this is <clears throat> more to the point, to say, quote, the growing body of literature on animal cognition and emotions demonstrates undeniably that animals have interests and points of view. Like us, they avoid pain and suffering and seek pleasure. They form close social relationships, cooperate with other individuals, and likely miss their friends when they are apart. Emotions have evolved, serving as social glue, and among excuse me, and playing major roles in the formation and maintenance of social relationships among individuals. Emotions also serve as social catalysts, regulating behaviors that guide the course of social encounters when individuals follow different courses of action depending on their situations. If we carefully study animal behavior, we can better understand what animals are experiencing and feeling and how this factors into how we treat them. I believe, and I think someday we can convince a court to believe, that such considerations are required under the National, uh, National Environmental Policy Act, excuse me, to ensure well-informed decision-making when it comes to projects that have the potential to impact wildlife, including decisions, by the way, like the ones made by Fish and Wildlife Service to ignore the, environmental, the conservation ethic of the Endangered Species Act. Um, what good would that have? Well, first off, it could at, maybe it proves decision-making on a case-by-case -case basis. Certainly, it couldn't make it worse. It's not going to make animals any more um, worse off um, as a result of the current government decision-making that ignores their point of view altogether. And it may help if, if, uh, eliminate some animal suffering as well. But my real hope is that it will move us towards a, a better social norm on these issues, move us from some legally enforced obligation to protect wildlife to a wildlife ethic. So probably many of you in this room are familiar with Aldo Leopold's 1949 land ethic essay published shortly after his death. But do you recall the story that he opened up with in that essay? Anybody? Yeah? You mean the, the wolf story? No, no. That might have been at the beginning of the book, but just the essay itself. Well, he begins with the story of the Roman king Odysseus. And if you recall, after returning from war, Odysseus immediately hung seven slave girls on one rope um, for their misbehavior when he was gone. Misbehavior probably being adultery. Okay? Now, Leopold wants to use this story to suggest humans have the capacity to grow ethically. Okay? He notes, for instance, that there was a notion of right and wrong at that time. Um, Odysseus' wife didn't misbehave. She respected her husband. But what he says here is that at the time uh, in, in, in the Roman world, slaves were chattel, and they weren't extended ethical considerations. Um, Leopold struggled for his whole life how to extend those ethical considerations to wildlife. And he died without a solution. And maybe it's my arrogance being a lawyer, but I like to think it's because he, he forgot about the law. Right? <laughs> he never mentioned the law at all in the land ethic. Um, but, you know, as I suggested order, uh, earlier, you know, humans also did not wake up one day and universally say that slavery was immoral, right? Many had to be forced that slavery was no longer the social norm through a legal obligation to do so. Um, but before that important, those important laws on slavery were even made, there must have been a reason for a group of individuals to have gotten together and start to challenge the existing norm, right? So earlier I said, you know, the, the, the hallmark of a successful law is moving from an obligation to an, sort of an ethical foundation in society. Well, before you even get to the legal obligation, there has to be something as well, right? And I like to believe that, you know, with respect to many things, and slavery as well, that the reason was the transition, tra the, excuse me, 
the transmission and mental digestion of new relevant information, okay? Not just rhetoric, but real information, for instance, on the impact of slavery. So maybe an ethical consideration, whether it's found in NEPA or in some other law, can do the same for wildlife by providing us the information needed to resoundly begin questioning the old norm of torture and imprisonment of animals and move us forward on that. So, you know, this may not be as grand, you know, as grandiose as trying to jump straight to an animal right, but it has real ability to push the ball forward. And we've seen these statutes do this in other areas of environmental law. Now to end on a light, little lighter note. Um, interestingly, the, NEPA is, is about the only thing we have, I believe, in the United States that could force government decision makers to sort of give ethical consideration to the animals in decision making. But there are a number of provisions in constitutional laws of countries like Germany, Switzerland, India, and Siberia that are, that are aimed towards similar type of thing, right? Trying to present some type of an animal point of view in decision making. A lot of focus, to the extent there has been any focus in these countries, has been on trying to find a substantive right in these statutes. But maybe the real place to, for these folks to begin is on procedural rights where the animals actually get incorporated into the decision-making process from their own emotional and cognitive standpoints. So I'll leave you with this. This is the sad existing norm, right? Pet lion. Um, and <laughs> that's the, sadly the norm we have to move away from and, uh, and uh, get that guy back out into the jungle, into the wild. So I'm ready for questions. When you stated um, that there was one wild lion for 80 in captivity, what are you? What does 80 in captivity mean? Are those individuals? Are those in zoos? Mm -hmm. What does that mean? You know, we have obviously there's lions in zoos. Lions are kept as pets. This is not unreal. Um, lions are kept by drug dealers to guard their weapons and drugs. Lions are kept by rich people who thinks it's a status symbol in their backyard. It's the new pit bull or something like that. Obviously, there's a lot kept with good intentions on sanctuaries. Um, so it, it runs the whole gamut. The private possession of a lion, to, lion is not outlawed. It will be, presumably, if the um, uh, once they're listed as a threatened species in the United States. But, you know, you could still obtain a permit to get one. Very informative. Um, I, you ended with a little bit of hope with respect to the Endangered Species Act, and, and I think, you know, I really don't want to leave you with any of that hope. Uh, so I want to bring you to what the most recent act by our government, which is this new ivory policy, which, of course, bans the importation of ivory absolutely, unless it's attached to an elephant. And you can do that two ways. There still is an exemption in the brand new policy from February 2014 for zoos, but I also get to bring two elephant heads home a year under the policy. So it, it's a continuation of these observations you make. Again, subject to the limitations you say, you need to have a certification that it helps the population and solves uh, some social ill. And we both know those certificates are very, very easy to obtain. So I, I just wonder how we can move on at this point if we continue to embrace that sort of glorification of either the presentation in captivity or the hunter, the great white hunter sort of notion. Um, anyway, I agree with your great talk, but I wonder if you can yeah. help me out here. Well, I think that's right. And, you know, <clears throat> I think part of the conversation, whether it's in the evaluation of an Endangered Species Act permit to import these animals in or to keep them in captivity, or if it's the context of NEPA, 
has to legitimately include the value that these activities have, right, to society, not to the individuals. And I think that I, I didn't quite go that far because I, I believe you can't start to have that conversation legitimately until, unless you start looking at the point of view from the animals because then it starts to diminish the value that, that humans are putting in on them, right? The reality is, and I'm from Colorado, I think, you know, we have a, a much more fondness of hunting and capturing animals than maybe you do here in Connecticut. But the reality is, is that when you start throwing these things out there, there is obvious, not obvious, there is often a ton of public input into how these, pra pra these practices are no longer, you know, a social norm. And so that's part of it, right? If you're going to legitimize or require agencies to start talking about the impacts of their projects on the emotions and feelings of an animal, then you can legitimize the other side to present into the same conversation whether or not these practices have any you know, utility left in our society, um, particularly because they have those impacts on animals. So I agree. I mean, there's no role for... Um, sport use of animals anymore. Uh, it's funny, you know, going back for this presentation and, and looking at some of Leopold's work, he said that in 1949, right? He, he, but, but unfortunately, he pegged it. He pegged it. He said the gadgetry was getting, getting ahead of the sportsmanship there, and it's, uh, you know, it, it's causing, a, a, you know, something that's been out of our control. We've commercialized it. And just like everything else we've commercialized, we can't rein it back in very well. Hi, great talk. Thank you. Um, if you're talking about making a fundamental change to, you know, whatever the social norms are, do you think it works? I mean, I do. I agree with you. I think it does work to appeal to rational, uh, ethical considerations and to use existing laws, assuming you have them, which is rare. Or do you think you need to appeal more to emotions? Is it going to be right. enough to try to get people to think rationally and to act ethically? No, I think, I think it is for the common person emotion. I think if you ask asked everyone to change their mind based upon my presentation, we would fail dram dramatically, just like we would fail to listen to Al Gore all the time. No, I think that part of what I'm, I believe is right, that the conversation within the context of a policy decision needs to be one at the emotional level. That, but it has to include the animal, too, because people will get in touch with that. And, and I think that's right. Um, it's not going to work simp simply to, uh, to hear the uh, larger philosophical reasons why we should do this. Um, which is largely why, out of Leopold, while people like to pick and choose from what he had to say that supports their, their beliefs, um, have just not really heard his message in a long time, because it is at a too, very philosophical level. But, um, but yeah, so I, I completely agree with you. I do think that, um, is that you want to follow up with the question? Uh, yeah, no, I, and, and I think, I think I, I, I'm, I'm not trying to say that the emotional appeal has to be, has to come in the form of, deciding that animals have individual rights. In fact, that might be off-putting to at least some portion of folks who really do care about. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm, I'm just asking, do you really, do you, do you think we need to just change the approach to being individual rights? It sounds like you don't, individual animal rights. Or do you think we should be using the framework that we have? Say that last part again? Should we be using the framework that we have and trying to move people, you know, in well, the right direction, or do you have to really go straight to animal rights to really make a difference? Well, I think that's the goal. I mean, I, I, I agree with 100% what Joyce had to present with personhood and, and animal rights. Um, but look, I've been practicing in the courtroom for 19 years, and I still have hope that we can move some things forward through NEPA. And this is something that hasn't even been tested in a courtroom yet, something we're hoping to do soon in the right courtroom, obviously. So I, I think, you know, what can you say? I mean, you gotta push the ball forward towards that. 
And this is something that may be achievable in life. We may get a court to say you have to take into account these types of things in my lifetime. So I was going to say the biggest, the biggest hurdle as well, and what really causes me the greatest grief, is I think the public will listen. And I think they want to engage in this discussion about how, you know, sonar physically affects and emotionally affects a whale. The biggest challenge is that the party responsible for giving some assurance that the information is legitimate, the government, is the one that's trying to undermine that information, right? And that's the problem with climate change. People want to engage in it. But there's just enough out there that threatens their ability to feel secure that the information is scientifically legitimate to make them not know what to do. And I have always believed, and I, I feel like going all the way back to the Federalist Papers, one of the role of government is to help lay a foundation for us to have a debate, to provide information for us. But now they want to keep information from us, and that's the biggest problem. That's the biggest hurdle, of course, to what I'm proposing. Now, a judge may very well agree with me, but the, whether the agency goes back and presents anything that's, you know, remotely, you know, a fair view of, of the issues, that's, that's another point. But we'll have to get to that <laughs> once we get uh, some legal mandate that they actually take these types of things into consideration. Yes. Just a quick comment. Um, I don't necessarily think that the role of government is purely against the message. I think that it would be, it's an observation that there is a hard lobby on the other side that does factor into those decisions made. So I just wanted to point that out, that the lobbying industry is. is well, I, I, I have to say, and I'm not going to, you know, debate this with you, but, you know, we, we know what happened in the last 10 years. We know that political appointees were given the opportunity to rewrite all the scientific documentation on things like the Delta smelt and others, that the scientists presented one, you know, scientific point of view, and political appointees were given the liberty to change it all. And, I, like, I mean, when I, it was funny. I, when I first got out of law school, I worked for an, an, a, a former assistant U.S. attorney who prosecuted in wildlife crimes, believe it or not. And uh, our first case was against the Navy over a home porting project in San Diego, California. And when we got the documents in the administrative record, I mean, it contained the good, the bad, the ugly. I remember Steve Crandall say, you've got to love suing the United States. They get up in the morning, they put on their pants and flag, and they give you the truth. That's BS today. I mean, I get nothing in the record. I get nothing. They don't produce anything. They don't want to tell us what they're doing anything. So, you know, maybe it's just uh, 19 years of being disgruntled a little bit. But you have to fight a lot harder for it, let's put it that way. And sadly, it's the political appointees, not necessarily the scientists in the agencies, the ones who, you know, are trying to do what they're supposed to do under the law that are getting in the way. Just, to just another aspect, the other side of that is that we vote for these politicians. Mm -hmm. You know, we we the people, we we are the ones who put them in office. So we're, why should we be surprised when they do the things that you're describing that they do as a you know as government as politics? Mm -hmm. So so really, the issue comes back again to the public and to what we are able to do as citizens. Mm -hmm. And so I, I just can't leave that factor out. I don't think anything has ever changed in this country social movement-wise, without a, a huge public uh, uh, agreement about it, not agreement, but at least enough of the population in support of things, whether it was, you know, the women's right to vote, civil rights, the end of slavery, even smoking, you know, in public places. Mm -hmm. And there, there's a pretty good body of evidence, of re social science research, that says if 5% of the people believe something, they have the influence to make 20% more believe it. And once you get to that 20%, mm -hmm. then it's possible to get much, much further. Right. So right now, we're probably in less than 5% of understanding what you're telling us. So to me, I think of it as a citizen obligation, citizen education. And that only comes from grassroots people and working together with 
organizations like yours right. to change the paradigm, to change right. the thinking. Well, you, you know, it's interesting. I don't know if I agree it's 5 percent. I mean, for instance, in, in the West, like in Colorado, the numbers that support wolf reintroduction are up close to 50, 48, 49 percent. It's, it's just that we've lost the ability to, to engage that or, or turn that right into action. Yeah. Maybe because we don't sit around the parlors with the piano anymore. We're just all off doing our own thing, right? Having con real conversations about this stuff. So. And what to believe. I mean, and what to believe. So much There's so much misinformation out there. That even those 49% of the people, they, te they tend maybe to have a hard time to talking about it and, and into anything more than the rudimentary stuff. Well, I heard this, I heard that. And I think it would be a good idea. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much. We're going to go to lunch now, everyone.